This is my DIY off-road camper. And the question that I get asked over and over and over again is, do you have a set of plans? Or conversely, I'd love to build one, but I think it's beyond me. Well, today's episode is for you. I've got a full-size plywood sheet that is the same size as what I've used for the side panels on the camper. Today, we're gonna to go through the design process as if we were building a new camper. We're gonna mark out the ply, and at the end of the episode, you should feel confident about marking out your side panels and be ready to cut them out. So stay tuned. Hey guys, my name's Daryl, and welcome to the channel. Now, today, you can see a piece of ply behind me. It's got stuff scribbled all over it. Um, I've designed up what is basically my camper on this piece of ply. I haven't got the exact measurements there around about, but they're good enough for you guys to be able to look at it and make some decisions to where to start. As I said in the intro, I see lots and lots and lots of guys saying, oh, I just don't know where to start. Where would I start making a camper? There's no real plans as such, and to be honest, I don't think a set of plans would help. It's, it's far easier to just get onto a piece of ply and mark it all out and you can see exactly where you're going. With regards to CAD, I don't really think you need CAD. If you're a home builder building a one-off camper and you've got no in intention of getting things output anywhere. Uh, if, I think if you're a commercial guy, massive difference. If you're, uh, you've built a couple of these and you wanna start tweaking things, massive difference but i think as i keep saying for the home guy building their first camper not needed because they're just so simple to start with so let's have a look at where we start with regards to these things i'm not going to go into chassis today this is just marking out your camper getting an idea of where it's all going and preparing to cut out the wall so the first thing you really need to nut out is how am I gonna mount this on my chassis? And you've got a couple of options with chassis. The main chassis will be um, a square platform um, with a drawbar and an axle on wheels. With my chassis, I've got a single backbone that is the drawbar. I've got then got outriggers and an axle. This platform type of chassis will be the main type of chassis people will be dealing with. And as such, because you've got a square platform that you'll be mounting your floor on, you've actually got a side section that'll be a box section. It makes sense to cover that um, and cover it with a piece of ply. So you've got to work out what your side section here will be. And I've allowed 50 mils. And whilst I've allowed 50 mils, it may be 40, but it'll depend on your chassis. So you need to nut that out. With my chassis, because I'm mounting the floor to the cross members, um, I've actually run the floor right to the edge of the walls. Um, but to give it some structural rigidity, while I have screwed through the walls, I've also put some 50 by 50 aluminium extrusion uh, that's a 90 degree that envelopes the wall and the floor and I've bolted through both the walls and the floor and that holds all that together. Remember when you're doing any of this stuff, when you're putting timber against timber, everything's glued. It all has to be glued and screwed. Um, I'm not a fan of just uh, gnarling or you know staples or whatever. Uh, for me, I'd want a mechanical fix that's screwed. So anyway, to start with, I've allowed a 50 mil piece all the way along the side so that will cover up the side platform of this chassis. You've then got your floor. I've allowed a 20 mil floor. So from front to back, I've just put a line along there. That's our 20 mil floor. Um, and that gives us our final floor level. So we've already allowed the 40 or 50 millimetre covering for the external bar on your um, platform chassis. We've allowed 20 millimetres for your flooring. Um, you may get away with 15 or 18 mils, that's up to you. Um, I've got 18 on mine and it works a treat. So our final floor level is here. 
Now the next space that we have to allow for is where our spars will sit. Um, so you need to do that at the front, top and back of the camper. On, at the moment we're not cutting out, we're just allowing space to see what we've got to work with. For spars I've used a 42 by 19 millimeter Tasmanian hardwood, um, whatever hardwood is available at your part of the world. Um, I wouldn't be using pine for this. I don't think it's suitable. Um, for me, I'd like to see a hardwood here. And these are glued and screwed uh, to the sides of the camper. There's numerous ways to do that. We're not going into that today. We're just marking up. So we'll mark a line 42 mils in from the edge of the camper, front, back, and top. We're then going to do a line for our interior lining. If you allow three millimetres, that should be enough. Whether you're using, you know, a three millimetre sheet of ply, some gloss composite material, there's numerous things that you can use. Three millimetres should be more than enough. So draw a line inside where you've drawn for the 42 millimetres, allow another three for your interior lining. Do that front, back and top. And then we've got our interior space with regards to the camper. One thing to note is this square here at the front of the camper where your mattress sits up against the wall. If you're looking to do a teardrop style camper with a constant curve from top to bottom, if this curves up, here, your mattress will be pushed back further and further and further, unless you get a, a mattress that has a custom cut to the shape of the camper. It's always a good thing with these, if you're trying to keep your camper light and compact, a square section here, so you can push the mattress right up against as far as it can go to the front of the camper um, without any wasted space. There's a couple of things you can do. You could put a storage compartment in here if you did have, you know, the traditional teardrop type of thing. But again, you're taking room away from the back. So, chaps for the unwary when you're designing this up. And this is why we do mark all this out before we start cutting shapes out. Now, the next item is your mattress. Your mattress size will dictate the width of your camper, more than likely the length of your camper, uh, the weight of your camper, the size of your galley, it's gonna dictate a whole heap of stuff. Why will it do that? It's really simple, it's really self-explanatory. It's the largest item that you're going to fit inside this camper, but um, the width of the camper is dictated by the mattress size. Um, more than likely, your mattress will just sit within the walls. So, uh, depending on the width of it, is how wide your walls are. Um, we've got the mattress pushed all the way up the front. We, we showed that in the last scene. Now, the end of our mattress finishes here. Um, this is a double. Now, I've marked out this double bed mattress with blue tape so you can see it quite easily. The size of this is the same size as my mattress inside my camper. It's 180 millimeters thick. I purchased my mattress from Ikea for a few reasons. It's quite a comfortable mattress. It's inner sprung. Um, they come rolled so that you can push them through the door easy. And because they come rolled, um, you can re-roll them slightly so you can get back out the door. So that's something to think about if you're putting mattresses in these things. Uh, a lot of people just use a foam mattress. I wanted something a bit better quality with an inner sprung on it. And I've also put a, a pillow top on top of my mattress and it's the most comfortable thing ever. But anyway, um, I've found the mattresses from Ikea to be quite good quality and reasonable price. So make of that what you will. But anyway, this is our mattress. Now, a queen size mattress in length is about 130 millimetres longer, and I've, I've drawn it out here. And at first instance, you think, oh, that's not much. So let's say I was pedantic and I wanted the extra 130 millimetres of queen size mattress. First up, the camper would be wider. It just is. Um, and it wouldn't have fitted on my chassis. I would have had to extend the chassis had a wider axle again, um, adding more weight. The ramifications though with the, the design of the inside would be that with another 130 mils, my galley would only be 400 deep instead of 530 deep because I wouldn't have been able to put my feet down to the end of the mattress. Um, this is where my 
bench top sits and it sits there because of the height of my chassis. If you had a lower chassis that would lift up and it may lift up enough if you have a low enough chassis where it's usable. However, however for me with my chassis at the height it is, um, with the bench top at the height it is, it was just a no-go to have a uh, queen size mattress in it. Now the other item that would have changed with regards to the mattress length is the outward appearance of the camper. Now I've put an off-road cutback on the back of my camper and that angle is mimicked at the top front of the camper too. I just like the look of it. So for me I've run an, an, a cutback angle from the bottom of this bulkhead to just under the kitchen bench. It looks nice, it's a nice angle and I've mimicked that angle at the top diagonal of the uh, front of the camper too. If I would have gone the queen bed route, I would have had a much shorter, much steeper angle. And that would have had to be mimicked at the front too. It wouldn't have looked as good. So it affects aesthetics also. Now there'll be a whole hoop that'll put their hand up and go, oh, you should have just had a square at the back instead of the cutbacks because it's storage that you, you're missing out on. And it's true, it is storage you're missing out on. However, for the look of the camper that I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. Now this blue tape that runs from floor to ceiling is the bulkhead that divides off the inside of the camper to the galley. Uh, in my camper, underneath the kitchen bench, that bulkhead has got a cut and I've got screws each side that I can take off and take that bulkhead section out. And that gives me access to this triangular section underneath the kitchen bench top. That also allows me to maintain the loom, add more wires if I need to. Um, I don't have a kitchen sink in this if I wanted to add that. I probably don't, but I could. Uh, it gives me options. And um, there'd be nothing worse than having one of these campers and not being able to get into that area to maintain the loom if you had a short. So it's something to think about with regards to your looms. I've also got a removable panel inside this cupboard here, and that gives me access to the loom that runs across the inside of the camper top. So I've thought about where the looms run and where I can get access to them. Now with the inside cupboard, that's 400 high and 350 deep, runs the width for the camper and is divided in the middle. So we've got uh, cupboard each. Um, the reason I've made it that size is that it fits our shoes in, um, and everything else that we would take for a weekend away. Um, and you can see the, the fabric boxes I've got from Ikea that I put in, in there. So I just carry stuff out, plonk them in, and we're good to go. Now the cupboard in the galley is 340 high and 230 deep. And the reason I made it that size was that um, I wanted to put a shelf underneath it. It gave us a good working area here all the way back to the bulkhead. And it also meant that size fitted our plates in standing up um, and our medium sized fry pan and a small saucepan, which is what we would generally take with us to cook on. Um, there'd be nothing, as again, there'd be nothing worse than making a cupboard and going, oh, nothing will fit. Um, if you notice, I don't have drawers. Uh, drawers add weight, I didn't want weight. And I've got, if you go back, I've got a navigator gear bag that all of our kitchen stuff fits in and I just leave that on the kitchen bench and it hangs up underneath the 270 degree awning when we get to wherever we are. I've got a fairly large shelf here and again we don't have drawers but we do have some drifter zip up bags that we put our toiletries in and underwear and socks and things like that and that works really well for us. Uh, this shelf here in the galley it's a smaller shelf um, we find that really good for foil, cling wrap and things like that. It's a really handy shelf, that one. But it's a fairly simple camper at the end of the day. And for us, it works really well. Um, but you can see by drawing all this up, we've designed our camper. The only thing we now need to do is decide on what shape we're gonna make this camper. So let's have a look at that. So after all that, we've got my camper down to a few millimetres here and there. And we've got to decide what shape we're going to make it. Well, because it is my camper, it's going to suit the square drop type of shape more than a teardrop. However, if you really wanted a teardrop design, the only real thing you have to change 
is to move this cupboard unit forward because the hatch will come down at an angle. And what that will mean is that you have to step this bulkhead forward too. Um, you, you generally have a step that goes forward and up and these cupboards just move forward. Um, but you are encroaching more into the living space and you're losing some of your galley area because of the sloping part here. Um, you're also losing a little bit of headroom here and as I said, if you make this bottom section curved, you've also got to push back the mattress. So, some things to think of. Now, it's always been said to me by manufacturers that the teardrop style is the classic style that everyone loves, and if you've got a classic car or something, it really suits it. Um, however, it, you do lose interior room and everything like that. If you want a more practical camper, the square drop style is that practical camper. That's personal preference and it doesn't mean one's better than the other. It just means they're different, which is a good thing. Now, if you're a newbie, what's the easiest shape for you to make? Well, for your first camper, if you're a little bit concerned, the easiest shape would be to make a square rear section. So don't cut anything off it. Um, you'll also gain a little bit of storage down here. What you will put a cut in is a rounded profile here. A little bit better wind resistance, but it does look quite smart, this shape. But the benefit to the new person is, is that you can use a flexible roofing material and it will be all in one piece. A lot of caravans use a flexible roofing material. It's a plastic sort of material, pre-finished in white. So you don't need to do anything to it. It's on there, it's finished. If you use a composite wall then, um, your camp is finished. You just need to put the edging on. There is a benefit with the edging with this design too, but I'll go into that into a moment. But with this um, flexible roofing material, and you could use aluminium too, it would work just as well and you'd have one sheet. But the benefit with this plastic material is it comes in a lot of widths. Um, when you're building these things, you want to make sure whatever width you're making your camper, you can source material in that width. If it's outside of the uh, standard widths of materials, like a lot of these composite sheets come in the same size as the plywood. Some colours come in uh, 1500 wide, which is what I've had to go for the roof on mine. Um, but yeah. So just be careful you can get the materials in the width that you need. Using this flexible material, you'd start your roofing here at this edge and it would just sit all the way along the top. It would bend quite easily around this half round and it would finish at the lower front corner. No joints, nothing. And then with your edging, instead of having to use the aluminium edging that I've used and had to cut all the angles and glue it down and waterproof it all, you can just use the standard caravan plastic edging because it would roll over this edge really simply. Um, so something to think about. Now that's not to say that doing a square drop in my shape is out of the realms of anyone, it's not. There's just extra steps. You've got to put actual bends in the roofing material. Um, getting roofing material that would go all the way around, I couldn't get it. I could get near it, but not enough. I had to have one join about here. Um, and where I've joined it, I've got a flat piece that goes across the top and it's all silicon down. Um, so it works quite well. If you really wanted to do a teardrop, the downside of the teardrop from what I can see is actually building the hatch. Um, it's not as easy as what you think and it's like building an aircraft wing. Um, that's, that's how I look at it. Although once you've done it, it's, it's done, so you don't have to do it again. The issue I see with the teardrop type of uh, shape is where the hinge is. And the hinge has to be waterproof across it, it has to move for all its movement, and it's the one point in a teardrop style uh, shape where you will get water ingress if you don't keep on top of maintenance. And if you look at older teardrop shapes, they always leak there and they rot there. So something to think about. If I was producing my camper again, I'd score my line up here. I'd get that angle. I'd replicate that angle here. But the only thing you need to be careful of when you're replicating your angle here is that you've got enough room to fit your door in between the front of the camper and 
your axle and wheel and tire. So building those things on their chassis is not a bad thing if you can do it, or you know exactly where your axle and your tire starts and finishes and the mud guard starts and finishes. On my camper, it was quite tight with where to put that door. Um, and never cut your doors and your windows out until you actually have your doors and windows on site and you can measure them and get them ready to cut because a lot of the times, especially lately with supply issues, um, get, getting a certain size window, you could be waiting six months for it. Um, so traps for the unwary, be very careful about that. But um, that kind of gets you to the point where you can cut out your sides. And once you cut out your sides, you can do the floor, hoist the sides up and you're ready to put your spars on. And it's a big leap forward if you're a new builder. And all that said, I hope that gives you guys somewhere to get started uh, if you're looking to build one of those things. It's loads of fun. It doesn't have to be done in a few weekends. Um, spend your time. For me, it's probably never finished. I'm always tweaking it somewhere, as you can see. Um, although at some point I would like to ramp it up a bit more and build another one. I do have some ideas, but anyway, let's not get into that at this point of time. Um, that's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you later. Bye now.